Next, from the annual conference of the Illinois Association of School Boards, state lawmakers give a frank review of Illinois' troubled finances and how this will affect the funding for education over the next several years. This runs about one hour. Today we're going to talk about last session, we're going to talk about the spring session, um, some of what the election might have an effect on, and uh, then we'll open it up for question and answer towards the end. So let's just review a little bit, uh, talk about the budget and, and where we left off for last session. So the budget was funded, um, or we were, they were hoping to have it funded by the $3.7 in pension borrowing. $1.2 billion in securitization of the tobacco settlement funds, $1 billion in fund transfers, $250 million from a tax amnesty program, and that's always an estimate, and then $400 million overall budget cut from fiscal year 2010. And as you all know, we still don't have the $3.7 billion in pension borrowing, and I believe Representative Montino might address how we're not positive we have the 1.2 billion from the tobacco funds either. And just, uh, those are all one-time revenue sources as well. So we need to come up with something different for this next budget. And they can talk about how we're gonna do that. <laughs> uh, just a brief reminder on the, the pension borrowing. It did pass in the House, it's up in the Senate right now. Um, Senate President, Cullerton had it up in two committees this past week during veto session. It was up in Senate Revenue Committee and Senate Exec Committee. They did not vote on it in either committee. I'm sure they could muster the votes to get it out of committee, but they do not have the votes to get it out of the Senate. Um, he did offer to Leader Redonio and Senate Exec Committee that he'd like to reach out to talk about ways to compromise so they can get some Republican votes to get the pension borrowing done. As of yesterday, he said that they had been in talks with each other, but that nothing had been resolved, and there uh, were still no Republican votes as of yesterday. The income tax increase is also something that's been discussed a lot. Um, Governor Quinn has, I believe, recently said that he feels he has a mandate for an income tax increase because the citizens of Illinois voted him in again as governor. Um, when I was in school, though, I was taught that a mandate was a clear win and 10,000 votes in the state of Illinois is not a clear win. I don't think an income tax increase is going to happen. Um, there are 18 lame ducks. That is always a consideration. They can maybe get some of those votes. Um, but I think that some deals are going to have to be worked out before anything is going to get done, which our legislators will talk about. Some other things, uh, gaming is something they're discussing during veto session, the possibility of having extra res revenues from gaming. Um, but again, every time gaming is discussed, uh, every, every group wants their piece of it, and then it gets so big, it just topples it over its own weight. So it'll be interesting to see if something can get done with that. And then Senate President Cullerton also recently put together a bipartisan committee to discuss workers' comp and Medicaid. Um, those are issues the Republicans have said they want changes on before they're willing to put votes on any uh, income tax increase or that sort of thing. And so it'll be interesting. He said he wants that work completed by January 3rd. Uh, Speaker Madigan has scheduled a number of days in January in addition to the original six veto session days for this year. And then Senate President Cullerton scheduled two days in January. So uh, we may not see anything happen the second three days of this year for veto session, but we may see, th see some things move in January before the new, generally, new General Assembly comes in. So I will end my remarks there, and I'd like to start with uh, welcoming our legislators, thanking them for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. So first I'd like to introduce Frank Martino. He's a state representative for the 76th District, which is North Central Illinois. He's the Assistant Majority Leader. He's beginning his sixth term in January, and he serves on the Appropriations General Services Committee, Insurance, Revenue and Finance, where he's the Vice Chair, and the Tollway Oversight Committee. So please help me in welcoming State Representative Frank Martino. I'd like to uh, 
first of all, thank Susan for giving my speech. <laughs> it's an honor and privilege to join with you here today. It's actually my 10th term in the uh, General Assembly. And in the course of those 20 years, I've served with some tremendous people on both sides of the aisle. And, uh, and it has been a fascinating, fascinating process. The people you have in Springfield for you, Susan, Ben, Deanna, do a wonderful job representing the interests of the school boards. And uh, they have a say in all the school issues, uh, as they should and as you should, uh, throughout the state of Illinois. They've done a wonderful job, and I think they deserve a round of applause. <clears throat> For a number of years, uh, and I know uh, I actually have spoken to many of you throughout the, uh, throughout the years, uh, this is probably, uh, is now, and will be one of the most uh, difficult sessions of the legislature and probably one of the most difficult times in the state's history. We have budgets that in past years we had made structured on having $29 billion coming in from a strong economy in Illinois. And it's the fifth largest economy in the country. And when our country is humming along, it goes very, very well. In a year like this, and over the past couple of years, we'll be very fortunate if we hit a $25 billion mark. And throughout the course of the time, costs have gone up on a lot of things. But I thought for my few minutes here, what I'd like to talk about is the structural deficit and the hole that together we're all going to have to try and, and fill in a very, very difficult year. The current budget hole. And uh, you might hear slightly varying numbers of this, but it's not really far off. Most of the groups, either side, are going to have pretty much the same. Uh, the first part of this, and it's a two-part problem that we face in the state of Illinois, is the amount of unpaid bills that are on hand at the end of a fiscal year. So at the beginning of fiscal year 10, our accounts receivable was $3.7 billion. And that's the amount of money that we pushed forward. That's the amount of money at the beginning of the year you were waiting for. Part two is the structural deficit, and this is the most difficult and the most dangerous piece of the equation for all of us that are trying to make budgets and for you as you try and do yours. The structural deficit is how many bills that the state can't pay each year because of the current Reoccurring revenues can't meet the current reoccurring expenditures. In fiscal year 10, uh, the deficit on the, uh, on the final expenditure number was $3.1 billion. And the only way to balance that deficit is to push a lot of bills forward into the, uh, into the next year. As many, uh, there were quite a few that were pushed through. By adding that to the accounts receivable hole, you get an accounts receivable and a, a deficit of $6.8 billion. That's the big number that was missing. The $6.8 billion is the difference between keeping things at current levels and with a reduction of, le of revenue, how much money was going to come in. And so the, uh, what we're looking at, total revenues um, reoccurring for the state in millions is about uh, in uh, about $27 billion. There was a cigarette tax as part of this budget, which was worth about $320 million. That is yet to pass the House or the Senate. And so you've got your total revenues about 27, uh, 27 7. From the expenditures that we have, our appropriations are 26 4. And the lapse period is about $500 million. Pension contributions, and we'll talk about this for a few minutes, is $3.669, $3.7 billion. And over the past 15 years, the General Assembly, um, under Edgar, they realized that the pension obligations were growing, and so there was a structure set up which would pay normal cost of pensions and then dollars on top of that to get rid of accrued liability um, and bring those costs down in the future. And 
were in the latter part of those, the 15 year ramp. It was a back end loaded ramp, very expensive in the last part of the years. That's probably the largest um, area that is still unfunded in this year's current budget. Uh, we have, uh, in order to fill about $6.5 billion of the revenue in this year, that's that gap that I talked about between recurring expenses and where our revenues are at. One time monies were used for that. Uh, the cigarette tax, the tax amnesty uh, program, interfund borrowing. We did not do fund sweeps this year. A lot of you have funds uh, that were out there. We allowed monies to be used from state funds and borrowed for cash flow basis. There wasn't enough money. That amount could be certified, borrowed, and then had to be paid back into that fund. So that's, uh, uh, that was about a billion dollars of it. In order to get rid of some of the backlog of bills, we extended the lapse period and we securitized a portion of our tobacco settlement. From the federal government, we were getting a, a tobacco settlement, <clears throat> and those bonds are that securitization is supposed to go through here this month. I think the Bureau of the Budget will let them do that. And what that will do is allow for the bills in that lapse period where we're paying last year's bills with this year's money to be paid. And then we'll, we will begin on the fiscal year 2011 bills. So that piece should come to pass rather quickly. Um, and that's our hope. The only thing that would stop that is if the Bureau of the Budget did not go forward and, and structure that. They have plans to do that this month. So with, the, uh, with these revenues, the important thing that we have to remember is that 6.5 was made up in one-time money, and there is a borrowing bill for the pension payment, which is still in the Senate. It has passed the House. It needs to pass the Senate. And I say that because that's $3.7 billion that if it does not pass the Senate, then will be pushed into next year's bills. That creates a $3.7 billion bill and hole in the budget this year. You know, we don't have much time left within this year. So my hope is the Senate, uh, and they are moving towards uh, they've had good talks towards getting that done. It's an important piece of finishing out this year. But as we move into next year, the question becomes, $6.8 billion have to be made up somewhere. Cuts, new revenue, uh, there are some uh, tax proposals on the uh, income tax that have been brought forward. The governor has one which would fund a surcharge for education at 1%. I don't believe um, that that portion is going to pass as is. The 1% doesn't get things done or get any of the bills paid, and there are going to be a lot of uh, discussion about that. Um, to give you an, an idea on that, a 2% uh, income tax on the personal level which was uh, under other bills, and a corresponding rate for corporate income tax gets you to about $6 billion. And the trigger number everybody's looking at here is that $6.8 billion. Because the one-time things that were done this year are no longer available. I do hope that we can work together and, uh, and put a program together. I would like to see uh, new revenues passed in January at a level where we can start building out of this hole. Because it is truly a shame that uh, providers for the state of Illinois are having to wait six, seven, eight, ten months for payment. We're at a structure now where I think it's going to require cooperation from both sides and some very hard decisions. Coming up in January, uh, we have two bond payments due. One for 800 million, one for 1.2 billion dollars. 
uh, that will come forward. And it's going to have to, that puts additional pressure on what we have to do. So I think it's a, I think the people told us in this election, they don't want the bickering back and forth. They want addressing a solution. That solution is cuts and cuts that will hit people in this room in there. And they'll hit all across the board. Cuts, revenues, and there's going to have to be some borrowing, the pension borrowing. So these are the things and the, the issues I think confront us. And I think this year it has to happen because there are no additional revenues. As I showed you, the difference between the money coming in, we're now taking in at a minimum $4 billion less in taxes due to the economy than just having a flat budget. And look, to make those numbers work, it's going to take cooperation. It'll take some very hard decisions and hard cuts, and I think we're all going to be part of them. We have a number of seats in the front. If anybody wants to move up, we'll be flexible here and maybe pause for a moment if anybody needs to come up and find a seat because of the change in the venue from the Sheraton. Next, I'd like to introduce Ed Maloney. He is a state senator from the southwest side of Chicago, the 18th Senate District. He was just recently reelected to his fifth term. I hope I got that right. <laughs> He serves as the chairman of the Senate Higher Education Committee. He's also on the Labor Committee, Appropriations, Consumer Protection, and the Redistricting, Redistricting Committee. So please join me in welcoming State Senator Ed Maloney. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, I, too, like, would uh, like to thank Susan, Ben, and Deanna for their uh, service uh, as advocates for you in Springfield. Um, they serve as educators for us, uh, that's for sure. And, and very often I judge the, the, the quality of a, a lobbyist by, uh, they'll come into my office and they'll tell me about their uh, uh, particular piece of legislation and I ask who's against you on this and if somebody said, if they say no, I feel like I said, well then what are, you, what are you doing here, what are you worried about? Uh, these people know the other side of the issue and they, uh, they serve us very well. Uh, as Susan said, my district, uh, geographically, if you're familiar with the area, I uh, go from the northeast, uh, the northeast corner of it is 79th and Ada on Chicago's southwest side. I take in part of Chicago's 18th ward, most of the 19th, and then the close-in suburbs of Evergreen Park, Oak Lawn, Chicago Ridge goes all the way out to 143rd and Will Cook Road. So if anything is unique about my district is its diversity, and it's a pretty hard place to keep everybody happy. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't, didn't have to run for re-election this uh, this past election was a good year not to have to run. Uh, a lot of people are angry out there. Uh, my background is in high school education. I was a, a teacher coach out of uh, college and served for many years as a teacher, counselor, and administrator, uh, primarily at Oak Lawn High School and the Southwest Suburbs, and uh, um, also as an assistant principal at a Catholic high school, Brother Rice High School on the Southwest side. Uh, before I get going, just by a raise of his hands, does anybody need any money for anything? You guys have? <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my uh, just tell you a little bit about what's going on from the Senate perspective and from my personal perspective. I, I chair the Higher Education Committee, but as you know, those various levels of education kind of touch on each other. And one of the first things I did as chair of the Higher Ed Committee was to have a hearing on the graduation and retention rates in the state of Illinois. And what this resulted in was a lot of polite finger pointing between the high schools and, and the community colleges and colleges. The community colleges saying, you know, that these kids aren't ready. Uh, the high schools are saying, well, you're, you're not telling us what you need. And this resulted in, in finding out the tremendous need for remediation uh, for high school, the transition of high school to community college. And what we found out as well is that the students in need of remediation, their retention and graduation rate is very, very low. Uh, we're talking about single digits, so when people come in needing significant uh, remedial scores. Uh, we had a, a committee, the National um, Council of Higher Education Management Systems came into Illinois last year and said if we don't do something about this remedial uh, problem uh, that we are going to have uh, problems with our workforce. So in response to that we passed uh, about three years ago a bill called the Career and College Readiness Act in which um, it was a pilot program involving four community colleges throughout the state, uh, Moraine Valley, South Suburban and two downstate uh, community colleges in which we identified the um, remedial needs of students in their junior year of high school and work to correct those 
in their senior year. The program is almost four years old now, and we have numbers to indicate that it is a success. We passed legislation with the help of everybody up here, expanding that program to seven additional community colleges, and uh, the governor signed it. The question is the funding, because uh, <coughs> this clearly is a, an issue that we have to deal with. Uh, so hopefully we can expand it. I had a uh, conversation recently with Chancellor Hyman of the uh, City Colleges of Chicago, and they spend $30 million on remediation in city colleges. Uh, fully 90% of the students entering uh, city colleges need math remediation. So it's an issue that, that definitely, if it, does, if it isn't addressed and we don't uh, look at it, it's going to create problems for us later. The other area uh, that affects your students as well at the high school level is the preservation of the MAP program, the Monetary Award Program that we had to battle last year to, to keep uh, at its current funding level. Uh, it is one of the better programs in the United States. It, it's a, a need-based program that um, um, is limited, obviously, in its dollars. Please encourage your students to sign up for MAP early. It's a first-come, first-served program, and very often the students in most need are the ones who are, who are shut out of it. Uh, we, had a, uh, uh, we just concluded a conference. Uh, 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 we had a joint House Senate Resolution 88, which uh, addressed the affordability issue in the, in, the, uh, in the state of Illinois as it relates to higher education, both for the individual and for the universities. And we are looking to uh, uh, look at some concepts that are currently not in practice in the state of Illinois. Um, performance-based funding for some of the universities. We're looking for to put a blended type of uh, qualification on the MAP dollars because very, not very often, but sometimes the MAP recipient takes the money, doesn't make much academic progress, and reapplies the next year. So these are things that we're looking to um, hopefully save money um, uh, for both the individual and the college. Uh, with, with Representative Eddy, we have worked on trying to reduce the number of mandates that we pass and we pass on to the uh, um, uh, high schools and elementary schools without attaching the dollars. Uh, Representative Eddie will, will elaborate a little more on that. We're also, we tried to limit the number of teaching mandates and leave it up to you, the, the superintendents and the school boards, to determine what those were. Uh, we were unsuccessful with that effort last year. Uh, we could get into why that was, but uh, uh, we hopefully will be able to do something about that later. The situation in the Senate, I believe I'm the only uh, senator up here, uh, I, I feel the mood is, is much more, there's much more a collegial and cooperative move in the Senate in the Senate with the new leadership in the Senate. Senator uh, President Cullerton and uh, Minority Leader Rodonio seem to get along personally. They seem to be on the same page about what's important. Uh, the, the President, as uh, uh, Representative Montino mentioned, uh, has agreed to hold a, um, uh, a um, Committee, working committee on Medicaid reform and workman's compensation reform. And, and what this is kind of an olive branch toward uh, 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 Senator Rodonio in the hopes that we will get some cooperation on this pension borrowing bill. Uh, that if, if it doesn't pass, as, as the representative mentioned, we are looking at some, some significant cuts uh, in, in other programs. So um, this is one of the reasons we need this. In terms of new revenue, uh, there was a lot of talk this week in the Senate about a gaming bill, um, the gaming bill is so big uh, that it, it's difficult to get everybody on board. It calls for four new, five new casinos, I believe, uh, one in Chicago, uh, Rockford, Park City, uh, a south suburban site which has yet to be determined, and Danville. And it will also allow six um, racetracks to have uh, slot machines. So the mere size of it has some people turned off. It will produce estimates, depending on who you listen to, about a billion dollars a year, however, in revenue uh, for the state. The other issue, of course, in terms of raising revenue is the income tax. Um, the, uh, the governor is calling for the 1%. The Senate in 2009, was it, or Nine. was it just, yeah, 2009, <coughs> did pass the, the income tax, but um, it, it, it failed to pass in the House. You see the problem, uh, so what, the question is on the big board out there, uh, what to expect, and I can look you in the eye and ask to tell you I don't know. Uh, I think that, um, I'm not trying to be flippant, but uh, all these issues are in play here. And the problem in Springfield is, is and it's been my experience, there is no easy issue. And, and the reason there is no easy issue is, is the diversity of the state. You have, for example, 59 members in the Senate that range in age from 33 to 80. Uh, they're men, they're women, they're black, they're white, they're Hispanic. They represent districts like mine. They represent inner city districts, wealthy suburban districts, rural area districts. 
everybody brings with them their own baggage, if you will, about what's important to them personally. You know, my background is in, is in high school education. The guy who sits next to me is a former prosecutor. Reverend Meek sits behind me there. We have farmers, businessmen, lawyers, etc. And now you throw in the Republican-Democrat dynamic. Uh, it, it's, it's really amazing anything gets done. There are thousands of bills introduced each, each session of the legislature. Uh, four or five hundred of those thousands become law. And, and of those, the governor very often finds issue with them as well. So uh, the, the public very often says, why can't you guys just do this? And, and, and you're, when people trying to conscientiously represent their district, that puts them up against the priority of somebody, somebody else's district. See, everybody has a priority. And to be honest with you, you, you guys are competing against corrections. You're competing against social services. You're competing against transportation for the limited dollars that we have there. So, um, I, you know, as my former president, uh, President Jones, said, when, when, when he would ask for increased revenue and everybody says, no, we can't do that, the people don't want that, and then he would ask for cuts and people said, well, we can't cut anything, he had a great saying. He said, you know, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. You know, and, and that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at that kind of mentality. And I, hopefully, because of the situation in, we can change that type of mentality and get a little more cooperative move and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Our next legislator probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, Roger Eddy is the state representative for the 109th district in Crawford County along the Indiana border. And he was just recently reelected to his fifth term. He is also the superintendent at Hudsonville CUSD 1 and has been in that position for nine years. Representative Eddy serves on the elementary and secondary committee and the elementary and secondary appropriations committee as well as the investigative, public policy and accountability, computer technology, infrastructure, and revenue and finance committee. So please join me in welcoming Representative. Thank you. It's, uh, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a, uh, a crowd that I enjoy speaking with because I know the language. Uh, the, if this were an environmental and energy conference, I probably wouldn't know anything about what I was talking about. So this is, this is one that I always enjoy. I just, I don't want to pile on here, but I do want to also sing the praises of the Alliance team that uh, represents you in Springfield. Uh, ben and, and uh, Susan and Deanna Sullivan is here, and I think Diane Hendren probably is running around here somewhere. And, I mean, they, Juan Kia for the Principals Association, Cal Jackson for the school business officials, they do an outstanding job. You know, there are two chambers with committee hearings everywhere, and these folks, uh, between labor and revenue and elementary and secondary education, regular and appropriate, they handle a lot of bills. And uh, they just do a terrific, terrific job of making sure that um, another side uh, gets uh, some uh, attention and some practical uh, application of these good ideas is, uh, is heard. I, I have had just a, a, a a real um, opportunity to serve in a couple of capacities. First, uh, to serve constituents in my district and serve on these education committees and listen to all the good ideas. And while I'm sitting there, I also have the opportunity to think about how this will really work, or if this will really work, or probably more importantly, what are the unintended consequences from this intended good? No one comes to the General Assembly on either side of the aisle and has drafted an idea that they think is bad for kids. They, they draft ideas that they think are, are going to move everyone forward. Sometimes, though, because of competing interests and other complications, those, uh, those good ideas turn into some consequences that are difficult to live with. Now, this last session, in addition to the fiscal issues that we faced, we faced some other pressures. We faced pressures having to do with that A word, accountability and reforms and how we're going to make our schools uh, more accountable to the public. And I want to talk about a few of those. I think uh, Frank has handled, and, and he's really the budget guy in the House that, that uh, sometimes I banter with on the floor and ask questions regarding budget items. And he did a good job of, of laying out a very bad scenario. So I want to talk about a couple of the other things that uh, we're facing. 
One came in the form of a bill that I co-sponsored along with uh, Linda Chapalavia, Representative Chapalavia, uh, and I have worked on several pieces of legislation, but this was the one that was supposed to help us with the points necessary to receive federal funding to, on Race to the Top. These were things we needed to do to put ourselves in position, and probably at this point, because we did not get Race to the Top, the single most significant portion of that bill is a significant change in the way we are going to evaluate teachers in this state and principals. And it has to do with tying the evaluation of that teacher and the principal to student achievement. Now, that seems to be a really neat idea and a good idea at first blush because shouldn't you be responsible and shouldn't, as a teacher, you be accountable for whether or not your students are learning? Sounds good, right? Well, we just went through No Child Left Behind, which set up a, a, an assessment system that is a benchmark system. That means that at fifth grade level, students should be performing at the fifth grade level. And if you're the fifth grade teacher, your students should be performing at the fifth grade level. You know, never mind the fact that when you got them, they were at the second grade reading level, and they made it to the fourth grade reading level. Well, there's, there's a change in, in approach to assessment that I think is a good change in approach, and that is a growth model assessment. And we're gonna see that happen, I think, over the next several years as we phase out No Child Left Behind and we reauthorize that. So I think a key component to supporting the idea, the notion, that we should, we should now evaluate teachers and principals based on student performance is the fact that it's growth. That's number one, it's growth. The other thing we're gonna have to do is get away from the notion that we can measure whether or not students are learning and or teachers are doing a good job based on a test that's given one day of the year. We have to get away from that notion. <laughs> you know, if it were that simple, we'd teach the test. You think that's happening? I think it probably is. We are, we are hopefully better than that. And what we do for children hopefully is better than that, than to teach them how to take a test. I mean, we know in education the purpose of assessment. The purpose of assessment is to guide teaching and learning. It's not to compare schools, and it's not to, not to try and open charters or provide vouchers or to point to public schools and say, you're not performing very well because of this one test one day of the year. We have to get away from that notion. And this legislation is written so that at the local level it's possible to have multiple assessments that guide student learning and improve teaching. I think that we have a terrific opportunity with this legislation to do that. I really think that if we, if we look to the future, that's some of what we need to keep an eye on, how this is implemented. Now, along with it, we pass legislation that allow us to do data collection. Uh, we received a federal grant because of the legislation that we, uh, we passed, and there is going to be, I hope, a, a very thorough data collection system in this state so that we can not use it to have newspaper articles that compare one school with another, but to use it to guide teaching and learning in our, our schools based on another new notion that you're gonna hear a lot about in the next several years, and that's a, uh, an evolution of the MLA learner standards that were introduced in 97 to a new set of common core standards. Now the State Board of Education has already adopted those common core standards. What we need to do now, first of all, is implement them. Well, the biggest thing we need to do is get teachers not to roll their eyes and say, oh, here we go again, here's a next new silver bullet that's racing by. This is gonna fix that. We have, to, we have to somehow address that as an evolution, but we have to also develop an assessment system, unlike the ISAT and the PSAE, that never really assessed the standards as well as it should. And in fact, the disconnects are so great in some cases that you wonder why you're given the assessment sometimes based on the standards. We have to align those things. We have to make sure that as we roll out assessments, that those assessments are actually aligned to the Common Core Standards. It's a lot of work. Now, there's lots of things in the future that have to be done. A lot of those are gonna be done by rule, so keep your eyes on the rules that are rolling out and not just the legislation, as always. Sometimes I sit in committee and I watch a piece of legislation go through the elementary and secondary education that looks like a canoe, you know, like a blueprint of a canoe, and by the time I see the rules and regulations that they'll go to JCAR, it's like a yacht. They've turned it into something that I'm sure they're well-intended, but it's not really the way we envisioned it when we, when we originally looked at the legislation. Senator Maloney mentioned 
something that I think is critical as well. We have to get to the point in this state that we stop <coughs> loading local school district up with mandates that are not funded. It, it has to happen. <laughs> now this year, we took a step. We took a step. We tried to do more. And sometimes with legislation, you try to do a lot and you get a little less than that, right? So I introduced a bill that would just simply say, if you're not going to pay for it, we don't have to do it. Well, that didn't really go anywhere the way that was written. We loved it. Actually. They liked it. We had a lot of meetings, and we had a lot of people at the meetings, didn't we? Yes, we did. A lot of people have a stake and an interest, right, in these mandates, so it's difficult. What we ended up with was a bill that the governor signed and, and Senator Maloney carried in the Senate that said, look, going forward, if a, if a mandate comes through that doesn't have to do with graduation requirements or special education, those things that we know there are other federal implications for, if the money doesn't come with it, local school boards can opt out of that mandate. And it's, by the way, it's not just for legislation, it's for rules and regs from the State Board of Education as well. And I think that's a good step, but I think we also need to examine existing mandates and look at the ones that just make no sense and come out with a bill, not for all past ones, and I understand that, I get that. For example, you're not gonna do away with the mandate for sexual criminal background checks. Just not gonna do it. That was not funded, but we're not gonna do away with it, right? So let's look at the things that make some sense. Let's pass a bill that allows that local flexibility for those things, especially in these times, and let schools make some decisions locally. Give you a couple. First of all, driver's education, $50 limit on the fee for driver's education. That was passed many years ago. When school districts wanna go up to $200, $250, they have to go back to the State Board of Education and the General Assembly to get permission to do that. We need to change that. We need to do away with our tinkering with the expenses we create in things like driver's education. Another has to do with this new rule on 70-30 in your elementary classrooms or really in your classrooms on special education, regular education student ratios. I, it, it just baffles me to no end why we think that an elementary classroom at the first grade level with 20 students, if you're lucky enough still to have to only 20 students in those classrooms, right, because of cuts, if you have seven or eight kids in there who have a speech IEP, for five or 10 or 15 minutes a week so that they can correct how they, they pronounce an R or an S, that that somehow counts that student toward a 30% ratio that would require you to have a second certified teacher in that classroom. Doesn't make any sense, but that's what the rule is, right? We have to deal with that. We have to look at these existing mandates, flush some out, and do something about them. Last year in review, very quickly, a couple of other things that came up, charters and vouchers, you're gonna to continue to see, you're gonna to continue to see attempts to deal with poor performing schools in ways that might save a few kids, but not fix the problem. And, and I, I don't think that's the right approach. I think what we have to do, we have to do for all children, and it needs to be systemic. If there are some things about charters that are wonderful, they're terrific, and we can identify those things, why aren't we doing them for every kid in the state? And why aren't we passing legislation that allows all schools to implement whatever it is in those charters that make those charters successful? We should do that. That's what charters were supposed to be about. 1992 in Minnesota, they introduced the first charter. It's 18 years later. If we can't identify something in 18 years about those charter schools that we can share with the other schools, we, we miss the original purpose of what charters are supposed to be about. We need to do that. Another thing that took place was pension reform. I, I hesitate using the word reform because I think we're not done with that issue. I think there are some, some serious problems still related to the pension uh, system, biggest of which is no matter what the benefits are, if you don't make the payment, the system's gonna go broke. I don't care what you do to the benefits. Now we made some changes in the benefits and some of those I supported. I think we have to pay attention to some of the things that are, are changing, and we need a sustainable and reliable system. There's no question about that. But you cannot, you cannot call something pension reform when in the same legislation where you're implementing reforms in benefits, you skip a $400 million payment to the Chicago public pension system as part of the deal. The problem with the pensions, the system, may have a little bit to do with the benefits, folks, but it has a lot more to do with the skipped payments than it does the benefits. And we're at that crossroad again. And what's our solution about that payment? And it has to be made, and it's $3.7 billion? Let's borrow it. Now that pays it, 
that pays it. But does that address the issue? And we're gonna be dealing with this, I think the second week of veto, maybe uh, for local municipal pensions, local government pension systems, because by the way, they're not in great shape either, right? We have to pay attention to that. We're gonna see more pension uh, possibilities in, in the spring and in the future. And I'll end with the, the budget. I am as flexible as anybody in the General Assembly about talking about how we solve this problem. But I think it has to be done in stages. It's kind of, kind of a simple notion. But no matter what the hole is, until you stop digging, you are not going to fill the hole. That should be priority number one. No new programs, no additional spending, no expansion. We can't afford it. We, but we've done that. In the last few years, we've still expanded. We've expanded some areas that we really shouldn't. Got to stop digging. Second thing, in my way of thinking, is Medicaid, which is totally out of control spending-wise, has to be controlled somehow. We have to do some reforms in Medicaid. We have to at least require the people who receive Medicaid to be income verified, like we do free and reduced lunch. But we don't do that, not to the level we should with the expansion. The other thing we need to do, in my view, is to make sure that the people that are using it make common sense decisions. They shouldn't be taking an ambulance to the emergency room to receive medical treatment. But we have that happen because we have very few controls on some of the rules related to how it's used. We want some of that stuff done. We also want to see something done to address the horrible job climate in this state. We need jobs. We need them. Part of the revenue loss we have in this state is the fact that we've lost a lot of jobs. We have to examine together why we've lost those jobs and work on solutions. If some of it has to do with workers' comp, we have to sit down together and figure out what reforms in worker comp will help everyone, including the workers, become employed. We need to make Illinois job friendly. We have to. Then, we're ready to talk about revenue. And there are a number of us who are ready to take a vote on revenue, but we don't want to just throw it into a hole that doesn't have any bottom or a system that hasn't been reformed. Once that happens, I think you're going to see a lot of people ready to talk about revenue, and I also agree that at that point, it's going to take a real wise scheme of borrowing and taking advantage of some of the interest rates we have right now to bond some of the debt. This is going to take several years. There's no quick fix. There's no you know, revenue we can pass in January that's going to take care of this problem, and we can all go on our merry way. It's going to take several years to dig out of this. We didn't get in it in just a couple years. But I think there's going to be the willingness to do that <clears throat> in a sequential manner. Let me end thanking you, because this is not an easy time to serve on a Board of Education. I know that. I know you've made tough decisions. There are probably some of you in here that in the last year have uh, had to take votes on releasing people from employment from, from your schools. That's tough. It's not easy work. You're leaders in your community. You did what had to be done, and you're going to face some more difficult times. And I just appreciate the fact that you are willing to do that for no pay. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. So last but certainly not least, <coughs> Linda Chapalavia. She's a state representative for the 83rd district, which is in Aurora, recently elected to her fifth term. She is most importantly to us, uh, the chairperson for the Appropriations Elementary and Secondary Education Committee. She also serves on the Veterans Affairs, Adoption Reform, Electric Utility Oversight, Infrastructure, Labor, you're busy, Fire Protection, and Revenue and Finance Committee. So please join me in welcoming State Representative Chuck Lee. The, thing, the great thing about being last is everything has basically been said. I was thinking about what I could cover. Um, the amazing thing is I, I've got to not only take my hand off to the, the gals and guys that represent you in Springfield, because I would do that just as well, but um, Mr. Uh, Eddie Roger, Roger Eddie, <laughs> his two names, uh, it, it, as long as you guys, I'm sure you have known me, I work very well with everybody on educational issues. I'm a, a small business owner by trade, but in the house we have a, uh, we have a certain kind of uh, family or friendship that education goes far beyond partisan. And uh, the other two people that I work very closely with is Pritchard and uh, Mitchell, too. 
I consider them extremely highly qualified and well experienced. And since I've only been in, this, I'm coming up on my eighth year, I, I consider that very valuable. Um, because I came in as a, a business owner, I'm a real estate broker by trade, and my husband and I had quite a few businesses, I like to take education on a different angle as far as, first when I got in I knew things were broken, but I really didn't know how bad it was. When you become appropriation chair in that level of leadership, then you actually get to see the numbers. Uh, for the last six years prior to that, we really didn't see the numbers. We were just asked to vote on certain things, and you really don't get in, in depth with what's going on with the state. Uh, I have been so extremely um, honored to be able to represent you with the appropriation elementary and secondary chair, but uh, I don't have any money. <laughs> so it's difficult to give you guys more money when we have none. We don't have a bank in Springfield that has money in it waiting to be sent to you, unfortunately. But we do have extremely difficult difficult decisions to make over the next three weeks uh, on your behalf. I want to also echo, and I said this last year, is that what an honorable position that you hold. Um, I serve you, not the other way around, and I'm so proud of everybody who takes the time to run for office, especially in this climate, uh, but everybody who runs for office and does it, um, and does it with great sacrifice, so I really do appreciate everything each one of you do. Uh, I look to my, my left here, uh, Mr. Martino, Frank has been a great dear friend and he does know the numbers and I think that's what we, we want to talk about today. So I, I think we'd rather, I'd rather sit down and listen to you and try to, uh, try to see where your issues are because how often do you get to, to talk with such experts on a panel, okay? But I do really appreciate being here. I love learning about um, your area's expertise. I've actually do dove into my district as far as East and West Aurora second largest city, well, Blackhawks, East Aurora Tomcats. Um, shout out, because I only have West Aurora people here. I've got to make sure I cover that. I don't think I have any East Aurora people here. If I do, I'm sorry, because that's where I graduated from. Um, but we've been able to work together on some stuff, some non-employee costs, some insurance things. We've been able to save uh, collectively around two point something million dollars of their willingness to come to the table and start to be creative about how we, we, we uh, tighten our belts. But in the state of Illinois, there's not one more important thing to me uh, as far as I'm concerned other than education. So I'm, he I'm here, I, I work for you really hard, and I'm hoping to um, get some questions answered for you and see how we can help together and work past this crisis. We shouldn't let it go to a waste because this is the time when we can really implement true reform in the state of Illinois for education. Thank you. I uh, told Susan earlier that uh, I'll go ahead and go last because then I can rebut what everybody said and, it, and it'll be great. Uh, but as was said before me, they pretty much gave my speech between the four of them what they've said. Uh, as you know, we have all, uh, Susan, Deanna, and I, uh, been talking to our members through the summer and the fall at our division meetings and, and generally saying that, uh, first of all, there really is no money. It's not that they have the money and are hiding it or not giving it to schools or anyone else. It, it is an economic problem. Representative Martino had said, I think, $4 billion less that the state has to spend than they did a year ago. So, you know, what do you do? And we can talk all day about what the legislature may have done with money in the good times, because believe me, I, we, we could probably talk about that. But where we are now is an economic problem, a budget problem. And again, from our perspective, we think what has to be done to get out of this Again, all four of these legislators had said that. Uh, they have got to work together, House, Senate, Republican, Democrat. And I think the message from this past election, from, from voters nationwide and in the state was, you know, get, get this done. Work on the budget. You can leave some of the other things to the side. Let's work on this. So uh, I, I, I think a good thing to do would be uh, uh, for this message to go to the other 173 legislators in Springfield uh, to go along with these four to do that. Uh, it is going to be long term, three, four, five years. It is going to be some new revenue somehow, whether it be an income tax or, or not, and borrowing and cuts and maybe gaming to get through this. And I think that's what they're going to have to do is hunker down to do that. Even in the Capitol, even among the Republicans, very few of them say no new taxes, period. There are a few. There are also some Democrats who say that. Most of them are saying we're not just going to raise taxes if we're going to keep spending it like we've been spending it 
to get back in the same position again in two years, three years, four years. That's why they say there have to be additional cuts. That's why some are saying, look at uh, well, Medi uh, Medicaid reimbursements or health care or whatever. That's why they took uh, a look at the pensions in the spring. Again, we have to make some adjustments so we're not in the same exact position in, in a few short years. So I think that is coming together. We hope it is uh, that both parties are talking together to look at all these issues and come together and get through that. And, and uh, I think it would surprise them how, uh, how well that might be taken by the voters of their district as well. They sit down and get that, uh, get down to, to business there. Uh, now we will uh, open this up to questions and this is your uh, opportunity. And uh, anyone with a question? Mike Kelly. Again, I, recognizing to start off with that you guys are all friends of education, so no, knowing that, the challenges are huge. It is a perfect storm. With the economy, we can't go to our, our folks to get more money from them. In our particular situation, we have $150 million sitting on the table with the tax cap that we've not been able to access over the, over the years. We couldn't, from the legislator, get CPI uh, reform last year to do that, the 1.1, we heard that. We've got our taxes, uh, our assessments going down, EAB is actually going to go down. We've cut um, $30 million out of our budget, out of a $260 million budget in Plainfield District 202. And we're looking at another 6.7. The state owes us 6.7 or 8 right now. And we saw the legislature not able to even get serious mandate help, financial help, this last year. My question is, what do you guys want us to do? You know, we're, we're trying to do this. The, all of our high schools are failing because of the, by the measure that's obviously crazy, but they're, they're failing. But the needs of education, and I will get to the question. The, the needs of education to raise the standards for our special needs kids, for our English language learners, all of those are great programs, but they cost money. And now we're $30 million down, going down another $6 million plus. And the question is, what do you want us to do? You know, the priorities have to change so that we can have a system that flourishes and meets all of our goals within the budget that we can afford to pay. Uh, I do understand and, and respect that question. We are going to have to do the mandate work, but also, we're, um, which Roger has done a lot of, but this year we'll have additional pressures. The last few years, we've been buoyed up by the federal stimulus package. You know it, most of your school districts over the past four years in general state aid have done actually very well compared to other sides of the government. And that was possible because of that stimulus package, which has now gone away. This year we were fortunate to get an extra $400 million at the very end, which averted some of those, uh, some of the layoffs, but that won't be there this year. That's an additional pressure. I think we need new revenue, not just for the school side. And I don't think it can wait. I mean, we'll start our discussions on the um, on the rest of the cuts and everything, and there will be some difficult cuts that will come in across schools because you are the bulk of the things that we finance. You know, you and healthcare in the state of Illinois, and that uses up when you throw in corrections, 80% of all the money there is within those three lines. And so, as we go forward here, we do need new revenue. We're going to have to make cuts, and if we don't send money. We should not uh, do the extra ones. Roger did a great job with any new mandates, but we're going to have to address those just like we gave you the opportunity to waive certain items in that process. I see that coming again because we know the extra money won't be there. So that's one thing that I would expect out of this year. Okay, um, <coughs> thank you very much. I think we're out of time. I uh, thank all of you for coming. Thank Susan Hilton for putting this on, and especially our four legislators. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government 
and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.